Okay, so we're here in Isa Surf venue here in Arecibo. Uh, we got Steve Fitzpatrick over here. He's a surf photographer and obviously an all-around photographer. He's he's been in the game for for a long time, and we're gonna we're gonna hear his story today. Steve. Uh, Tell me, let, let's start with uh, with your story, uh, your photography story. How, how did you start with photography? Did your family, did you have a uh, family that did photography? Or was it something that you you got yourself? Well, my, my dad was something of, um, you know, an, an amateur photographer. He was a photography enthusiast. So there was always a camera around. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back when I was a kid in the, you know, the mid to late 60s and the early 70s, um, photos were not as ubiquitous as they are today. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you had to spend money on photos. Um, a, a roll in a camera would last, you know, a month or more, you know. Uh, so it wasn't the kind of thing that was as, as, as accessible as it is today. But um, it wasn't something that was inaccessible in, in my family. So... Um, my photography journey kind of started uh, about eighth or ninth grade. Um, my dad had gotten himself a relatively new camera at the time, and uh, I started tinkering with it. Um, and, you know, just I always liked sports, so I shot my friends doing things, you know, sports related. Um, the first image that I really that really gave me the impression that I, that I had a, a knack for capturing action. Um, we had a pool in our backyard and we had a neighbor next door who, when I was 12 or 13, he was five and he would always linger around our driveway waiting to be invited in to swim okay. in the summer, obviously, cause this is in New Jersey yeah, and he, we only had like, you had a pool, so right. Like, yeah. We only had like four months to enjoy the pool yeah, yeah. and probably only two months when it was really warm. But he lived right next door and he used to come over and kind of he'd have his bathing suit on and a towel over his shoulder and he kind of linger around the driveway and we could see from the kitchen window. My mom would notice him and she'd go outside and go to the fence and say, hey, Billy, you want to come in for a swim? And of course, he was <laughs> keen to swim. Yeah, yeah. So he was the kind of kid that would spend like all day in the pool. Once he got into our backyard, he'd be in the pool for like eight nine hours at a time never got out maybe he got out to run next door back to his house and get lunch but you know he was a real water rat and and one day he was in the pool and i had my dad's camera out and uh, i captured this picture of him um doing a flip off the diving board and i just managed to capture him like completely upside down and you know his his head is down his feet are up you know, his his feet are kind of splayed. His arms are splayed. He kind of looks like an airborne frog. <laughs> yeah. And it was in black and white, obviously, Tri-X that, that I had processed at a local camera store. And I just realized that I captured that peak moment of action that just made the photo work. You know, a nanosecond before, a nanosecond after, it just wouldn't have been the same image. Yeah. Right. And we're talking about a time when you didn't get 20 frames per second. You know, and this camera didn't even have a motor drive. So it what was camera just a was one it? off. It was uh, a, a Pentax K1000. OK. And uh, he had gotten, uh, I think it was an 80 to 200 or a 70 to 200 lens. Nice. Um, that wasn't terribly fast. And it was what we used to call a one touch zoom, which mean that the ring that you controlled the focus and the zoom on was the same. It's right. like, it was like it was like you pulled on it, right? Right. You pulled, yeah, right. I have one of those lenses. Yeah. So um, I captured this image and, you know, it came back from the lab and and I thought, oh, wow, that's that's pretty cool. You know, maybe I have a knack for this. Um, from there, you know, I did a little bit of of darkroom work in high school, um, you know, the high school yearbook, that kind of thing. Shot some football games. I still was, you know, really finding my way. Yeah. And then um, when I got to college, uh, I went to Boston College and I became the photo editor of the student weekly newspaper uh, in the second semester of my freshman year. And that really jump started my ability to learn because not only did I have 
access to my own dark room and I had all my film and paper and chemistry paid for. But uh, I had, you know, top level division one sports to shoot. Um, I traveled with the hockey team. I traveled with the football team. I traveled with the basketball team. You know, I was on the floor at the Boston Garden shooting basketball when BC was playing Syracuse. Uh, there's a big hockey tournament in, in Boston called the Bean Pot, which is Boston College, Boston University, Northeastern and Harvard. And that's played at the Boston Garden, which, of course, back then was the old Boston Garden, not the not the TD, uh, TD Bank Center, which I think it's called now. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was ice level at the Boston Garden for those kind of events. Um, and I got to get on planes and go to bowl games and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, that just further solidified my interest in, in shooting sports. Um, it was about that time that I was that I was getting deeply into surfing. Right. Um, and where, where did, did you surfed locally in, in, in New Jersey? Yeah. Yeah. I lived about three quarters of a mile from the beach. OK. So I could ride my bicycle to the beach, yeah, which yeah. was pretty special. Um, you know, when I first started, it was it was a summer thing. Right. Just and, like and having was the it, pool in the backyard. Was it like did you see it and you did it or did, did your family do it? Did your friends do it? Like? No, no. My my family was not really a beach family. OK. Um, my dad enjoyed the beach, but my mom didn't really. Um, and none of my siblings were that into it. So yeah, it was kind of a solo mission. You know, I, I, the first surfboard I got, um, my brother had bought actually, and he had, uh, used it to do wake surfing, you know, in the river behind yeah. a boat one summer and it never came back, but he really wasn't into surfing. And I had to pester him for several months for him to get it back. So that was my first surfboard. Um, that next summer, um, I pretty much sent, spent the whole summer, you know, paddling into waves, trying to stand up and nose diving and doing face plants. Uh, and then for my eighth grade graduation, I got a proper surfboard and that kind of got me started. I think I was, uh, like a sophomore in high school, maybe when I got a wetsuit. So that then I could get past those warm months, which yeah. are basically, yeah, you, you know, surf for more time. Of the right. Year, yeah. I mean, basically the warm months in New Jersey when you can surf without a wetsuit, wetsuit are July, August and part of September. So when I got a wetsuit, suddenly that widened my area of, you know, my my window of opportunity to surf. So um, I started surfing more often. Um, by the time I was in college, you know, I, I was uh, I was surfing all year round, you know, winter surfing with the hooded suit and the boots and the gloves. Um, of course, when I first got to, to B.C., um, I was not very mobile. Right. I didn't have a car, so I really couldn't surf much. But that's when I started to come to Puerto Rico because I met a, a friend at B.C. who's actually the um, the director of the local organizing committee for this event. His name is Teco Maldonado. Okay. And um, so we, I, I think, we, we I think connected. I, I think I read in the book, right, that he he, uh, he he was studying something related to, to marine. Well, we, we were in oceanography class together. Oceanography, yes. Oceanography, and exactly. one of the first days of class of our freshman year, he, um, you know, we were in the same, same uh, you know, the same... Uh, Classroom, classroom, which yeah. which it wasn't a classroom. It was a lecture hall. OK. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like a little stadium. Mm -hmm. You have the, the professor down here at a table with a big old chalkboard and a screen. And then there's like an amphitheater of seats. Right. So. Passing, passing. So um, first day of class and the professor is kind of giving an overview of, of you know, what what we were going to learn. And at one point he was he was talking about waves and he asked a question about waves and I threw my hand in the air and he called on me and I said something like, you know, because waves travel in sets. And he was like, yes. And so at that point, Teku, who I think was sitting behind me in the lecture hall, he kind of saw and, and must have realized, OK, this guy must be a surfer. And I think I had like a quick silver shirt on or something. OK, know, some surf related yeah, yeah. T-shirt. And so, part, yeah. <laughs> so um, after class, you know, we're all walking out of the classroom and he and he came behind me and he's like, hey, hey, I turn around. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He says, you surf. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I surf. Where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. Oh, yeah, I'm from Puerto Rico. I surf, too. And so, you know, we just became friendly. 
after that. And did you um, know, did you know about Puerto Rico before he told you? Oh or? yeah, yeah. So you I, you're, already, you're already looking stuff up about surfing, and you well, I mean, you know, I like any kid from my era, I who was into surfing, I I was. Um, kind of a disciple of the surf magazines yeah yeah so i knew that puerto rico had warm water i knew it had more serious waves what, um, what were the surf magazines you read back back in the day surfer and surfing okay you know they were pretty much the only two that were out there yeah. at the time at least in the states so um so that christmas which would have been 1984 was the first time i came to puerto rico And, um, you know, our, our friendship beyond school kind of revolved around a dynamic where he would come to my family's house in New Jersey at Thanksgiving and other, you know, breaks that we had that were too short for him to get all the way to, to, to Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Yeah. And Christmas and spring break, I would go to Puerto Rico, come to Puerto Rico to since surf. we're here. Right. <laughs> and, and surf. Um, so that's how I got introduced to Puerto Rico. Uh, thanks to my friendship with Teco. And that obviously, you know, jump started my surfing. Um, at that point, you know, I was still, uh, you know, a, a novice photographer, certainly as it related to surfing. Um, I didn't have a water housing or anything. I didn't have any big lenses. I just had the stuff that I was using in college. Uh, and, you know, um, I was able to get my first taste of better surf in warm water. Um, you know, I, I tinkered with uh, shooting slide film and just trying to capture peak moments of, of surf action of basically my friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, from there, it, it just grew. Um, you know, I, I majored in romance languages in, in college with a, with a concentration in Spanish. And that in conjunction with being surrounded by a lot of Latino people, you know, put me way ahead of the other gringo kids that were studying Spanish. Yeah. Um, and then after college, uh, I got my start in my photography career first as a, um, uh, a stringer for a couple of newspapers in New Jersey okay. that cover one of which covers high school and college sports very um extensively and really better than any other paper in the country so that meant that uh you know i ran around the state shooting a lot of mostly high school a little bit of college sports and uh getting the, paid to do it yeah, yeah yeah uh and at the same time i was starting to assist uh commercial photographers in new york city um that kind of you know it shifted from more shooting for the papers to more assisting. And then actually my Spanish got me a, a, a staff job in a studio. Okay. Um, I was freelancing for this one photographer in this big studio in Manhattan. And um, he was uh, putting, to, he, he and his, his staff were putting together a big job that he was going to do for GM in Mexico City. And the production coordinator who was, you know, coordinating with the production company in, in La Efe that they were going to work with was having trouble communicating because she didn't speak Spanish and they didn't speak much English. So, you know, um, I don't think they knew that I spoke Spanish at the time, but I saw her struggling and I kind of went to the boss and said, listen, man, I, I speak fluent Spanish. I can help you guys out here. So I ended up on the phone helping to coordinate a lot of stuff for that trip. Okay. And of course, um, you know, that caused them to say, okay, well, you're coming with us. And that got me a staff job in that studio, nice. which I had for like two and a half years. What did you, what did you mostly, like, what did that studio mostly shoot? Well, the owner of the studio shot a lot of um, cars. Yeah? Yeah. And like on the street, or was it like in no, studio? no, like in studio cars? Oh, you know, wow, like awesome. for for so it was a big for, studio, for, yeah, beauty big shots space. of cars. Yeah, it was okay. 10,000 square feet. Yeah, you know, 5,000 square feet on each floor. The bottom floor had, I think, 16, 18 foot ceilings. That's practically what, what, what we dream of to have a studio uh -huh. to get cars in there, yeah, right? <laughs> That'd be awesome. So, um, yeah, he did a lot of beauty shots of cars, um, and then you know, also on location, not always in the studio, yeah. um. And then he also did a lot of, uh, you know, what we call photo illustration. Um, you know, I recall we had like, we had a dozen sheep in the studio one day. 
We had an elephant in the studio one day. Oh, wow. um, you know, it's just a, a lot of crazy, crazy wild. And this was stuff. in the city. Yes. And, Do you remember um, the location? What? what yeah, it was. Uh, it's that? called Hell's Kitchen. It oh, was at Fiftieth okay. Street between Tenth and Eleventh Avenues. Okay. Um, and then he had a, an associate upstairs who was a food photographer. And this guy shot, um, you know, menu board stuff for Wendy's, Burger King, McDonald's, all the big fast food chains. Yeah. He did uh, a lot of ice cream photography, which at the time was was really um, specific uh, and specialized. Um, back then, you could you could fake the ice cream, right? So like it wasn't really ice cream. Right. So he used to use he used to use um, mashed potato mix. Right. Nice. And well, he not he, but the food stylist. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the food stylist had this formula that could make mashed potato mix, powdered mashed potato mix look like any flavor of ice cream. You know, now, since then and not that long after that, they outlawed being able to do that. And I actually subsequently worked for another guy who shot a lot of ice cream. But by then it was real ice cream and he devised a system where he used um, dry ice wrapped in uh, tin foil on which the food stylist put the, the, the scoop, like a hollowed out scoop of ice cream. Yeah, because that's the only way you could keep it cold on the set. And even then it didn't last cold long. And as soon as the ice cream starts to melt, you know, you can't really shoot it anymore. Yeah, it doesn't right? look good. Yeah. Right. So, um, Anyway, that's that was kind of the nature of the work that got done in that studio. And I was there as a as a staff assistant for about two years. And, and what, what year what year was this again? This would have been 88, 89 and part of 90. OK. And, and how many then, years how many years had you been going to PR already? And at that point, uh, like five years, like five years. OK, like Four or five years right after getting out of college. You well, I started in, you know, in, in figure 84, I came at Christmas, 85, I came twice, 86, I came twice, uh, 87, I came twice, and 88, I probably came once, and I think I probably came back in 89, and then, so it was about 10 trips, and then I got, you know, into the assisting and, and the, you know, newspaper stringing, uh, and I couldn't get away that much, um, but by that point, I, you know, I knew my way around the island. I had a, a corrio of friends. Yeah, you knew some locals. Um, yeah. Right, right. Um, and uh, so I, I did that studio job for almost two years. At the end, I was a studio manager for like four or five months. Um, but I had always had plans to go to, uh, to Spain uh, and, and the Canary Islands on a surf mission. Okay. Right? Um, I had originally wanted to go to the Basque country to study Spanish, San Sebastián, where there's uh, there was a program okay. and there's a really good wave. Mundaka is not far away also. Um, but, you know, Boston College is a Jesuit university. So there's some religious stuff driving what happens there. OK. And the Basque country you know, always has had a separatist movement. And back then it was still pretty, pretty volatile. There's an organization called ETA and they're kind of like, um, like, uh, you know, the, the, the problem they have in Northern Ireland where that the, the Protestants aren't fond of the Catholics and the Catholics aren't part of the Providence. Okay. So there's a, there's a, the terrorist organization there, the name escapes me right now, but basically ETA, is an organization that wants to separate the Basque country from Spain. And especially back then, there was a lot of, you know, political unrest. There would be bombings and terrorist acts by ETA. So it was kind so of dangerous going there. BC in that time? wasn't too fond of okay, the, yeah. somebody wanting to go over there and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. that didn't happen. So then between my junior and senior years at BC in 1987, I went to uh, Las Palmas de Gran Canaria to in the summer for a two month study program. Okay. So when I, when I got out of college, I had my couple years in the, in the photography industry and I was kind of, you know, starting my career. Um, I still had kind of make it con las ganas de, de conocer a, al País Vasco. So okay. I bought a one way ticket to Madrid, took my three surfboards, 
you know, all my camera stuff, a tent, sleeping bag. And I spent three months in the Basque country, during which time I surfed some of the, you know, some of the biggest waves I had surfed up to that point in my life. Awesome. And by then I had also gotten a water housing. In 1990, I finally got a water housing. Yeah, so you were shooting so in the water. So I was shooting from the water. Yeah. Uh, and then while I was up there, I met a couple of Aussie guys who were kind of on a similar walkabout. And they were headed to the Canary Islands. They were headed to Lanzarote, where I had been briefly at the end of my stay uh, in the summer of 87. And, you know, I had been traveling by myself for three months, you know, living in a tent, basically. Uh, and after we'd been hanging out a while and they said they were going to Lanzarote, I said, well, you know what? I've been there. So, you know, let's make a team. And so I ended up down there for like nine months. Uh, and then when I came back from that experience to New York City, um, I just kind of realized that New York City wasn't necessarily the place where I wanted to be. Um, you know, obviously I stayed in touch with my friends here in Puerto Rico all that yeah. time. I knew how good the waves were. Uh, and I also knew that there really wasn't anyone documenting the surf here in any real serious way. Yeah, that's that's one thing I was going to ask you, like when you when you came here, like how were the beaches like were you like one of like two people maybe with a camera or you were you the only one with a uh, camera? well i mean there was always a camera around yeah. but there wasn't really anybody swimming with a camera okay so, so that was really rare at that time yeah it was like pretty rare not closure not not, not not that people didn't come you know uh representing the magazines yeah. to to do trips and whatnot yeah, but just and to they shoot might be the locals it, there wasn't anyone right but there wasn't anyone who was a resident here who was you know, specifically covering the surf scene with a lot of effort. Okay. And that was the void that I realized could be filled. And so I tried to fill it. Um, so that was in 92 when I came here. Uh, I came back from, from the Canaries in uh, late 1990, actually like the summer of 1990. I think I came home in August, August or September. And then I had like a year that I was working as a track photographer at the Meadowlands racetrack, a horse track, right? The, horse races. And here in Puerto Rico? No, no. In, uh, in the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I was shooting horse racing for about a year. Uh, and then I came here in the fall of 92. Uh, and... Um, You know, I, I started, uh, obviously I couldn't just show up and make a living shooting surf. So I started with the job as a, uh, as a bellhop at the San Juan hotel and casino. Yeah. And I did that for, I don't know, like maybe six or eight months. And at the end I misread the schedule and I was out surfing caballos which is right in front of El San Juan Hotel and Casino. Okay. I was out surfing caballos when I was supposed to be working. And the next time I came in, they're like, where were you yesterday? I was like, uh, well, actually, I was out there surfing. And they said, well, you were supposed to be here. Despedido. Oh, wow. So I got <laughs> fired from there. I ended up next as a waiter at Mona's. Okay. I don't know if you're too young to remember no, what it, Mona's it's was. It's a restaurant in It's Condado? a Mexican restaurant. Okay. Uh, you know where Tres Palmas is, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, well... If you're standing at the door of Tres Palmas and you have the gas station here and then that building with the um, with the laundromat in the corner, yeah. across the corner, behind there was Monas. Okay. And it was a Mexican restaurant where all the young, beautiful people hung out, um, you know, big party spot. So I was uh, I was a, a waiter there for like another year. Uh, and during all that time, I was kind of starting to get to know all the commercial photographers in San Juan. Yeah. So I started assisting because, of course, I had, you know, experience from New York City and that was, you know, valued. So I worked for, you know, some of the top commercial photographers in San Juan and I ended up um, getting more or less a staff job with a guy named Clay Humphrey. Okay. Who was the guy who shot pretty much all of the cars because he had the only drive in studio. Like like new cars, like, like right, like cars, cars for that. car ads. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I I had experience working with a guy who shot cars. So when Clay realized that I had that kind of experience, well, he kind of you know wanted wanted me there. 
So I was more or less a studio manager for him for like two years. Um, during that time, of course, I was trying to shoot surf whenever I could and making contacts with the magazines and the magazine editors. And obviously they knew, OK, well, now there's a guy in Puerto Rico. So, yeah. you know, we can count on Steve. We can send him talent, blah, blah, blah. And it all kind of just grew slowly but surely to a point where by about by about 94 or 95, I could pretty much support myself with photography. OK, you know, it wasn't all surf photography and I was doing some other editorial work. I was sometimes doing, uh, you know, jobs that that Clay would be offered, but they were just kind of too small for him or he had bigger projects going on that I was helping him with. And he would say, well, look, I can have my assistant shoot this for you. And at least it stayed in house. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it just kind of slowly, slowly but surely grew. And then by about um, 99 or 2000, I was more or less, you know, making an OK living with my camera uh, and concentrating mostly on on the surf. I, um, I read I read in the in the book, one of the beginning testimonials, was it where the, where the, where the person where is isn't you writing it's someone else? I forgot. I, I, I forget his name now, but the story was about you the first time, supposedly the first time you, you gave your your uh your transparencies to the magazine that that's what it was well there, Something there's about this, an airport is a story about an airport. right there there's a guy in tortola okay by the name of alex dick reed yes um he is from england originally but was raised on tortola and he was starting a magazine called the surfer's path the surfer's path was kind of like the surfer's journal in the sense that it was not necessarily about you know sponsored surfers getting all the ink um doing trips to far-flung places it was more about um the, the 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 parts of surf culture that have interest to the masses right it was more like the people's surf magazine because yeah. you know surfer and surfing magazine are all about the sponsored guys Average Joes don't get pictures in those magazines. So this magazine that Alex was just launching in that point was um, was more about the rest of us, let's say. So someone had given him my name and he reached out to me and he let me know that he was on his way from Tortola to England uh, because the magazine was based in England and he had to live there at least to get the thing off the ground. Yeah. So he was going to come through San Juan and was there a chance that we could meet and I could bring some photos for him to look at? And I said, sure. So we we met at the the I don't know, a restaurant or a lounge that's over at Luis Munoz Medellin Airport. The airport? Okay. And I brought my light box and, you know, a stack of slides that I had you know, uh, edited with him in mind. Were you already doing uh, work for other magazines? Uh, at that time? Yeah, yeah, I was starting to. Um, but of course, you know, Alex was just launching the magazine. Yeah. He didn't really have much. To so work you with. were going to be like one of the premier photographers for that. Ma like the first well, photographer for that. Yeah, magazine. I, w I was a contributor since. Yeah, since, issue since one. the beginning. Yeah, right. So, you know, I brought a, a light box. I, I, I brought a stack of slides and we sat down and, you know, he scoped some some slides and, you know, and, and chose some that he wanted to take with him that he knew he could make use of. And yeah, I mean, what he what he relates in that in that forward is that that was the first time that he kind of um, that he understood the responsibility of taking a photographer's slides, because remember, before digital, that one slide was all you had. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that, if that's that what was I was, that's if what I that was lost or damaged then me as a photographer, I lose the earning potential that that image may have may have had. But right? when you when you say it, like, explain, explain to the people what, what a slide is. Well, it's a piece of film that is a positive, uh, a positive uh, reproduction in, in terms of like, OK, we, we know what a negative looks like. Yes. Right. You look at a negative and you can't really you can't really get a sense of what the picture looks like yeah. until you print it. Exactly. Well, a transparency, a slide is a positive. So you 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 put a loop on it or you put it up to the to the window and you can actually appreciate the image because it's not negative. Yeah. It's positive. 
it, it's 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 the way the the scene looked. Yeah. The water's blue. The water's not you know green, right or red. It would so, be so in, the, in, a, the, in a negative. The slides gave you the color with, with the with the light under it. You could see the color. Yeah. So you put them on a on a light box yeah. and you have what's called a loop, which is a, a magnifier. Yeah. And you can look at the image well through the loop and get a sense of, you know, OK, it's nice and crispy or it's a little out of focus or, you know, the color's really good or the exposure's a little over. Or the exposure's a little under. Yeah, it's like a, um, it's like a preview for the people before they actually print it and all that. Well, right. And then yeah. the, anyone who's going to use that in print has to do what's called the color separation, which means that they 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 basically record that image and there's a way that they can take out. The cyan, they can take out the yellow, they can take out the magenta, and they can take out the black. Okay. Because right? those are the four colors that make up a color image. Yeah. And then when the when the paper gets printed, those colors get put down separately, right? First all the magenta gets put down, then all the blue gets put down, or the cyan, then all the the yellow gets put down, and then the black gets put down. And that's what makes the color image look correct. Yes. Right. <laughs> but the point being that um you know, a transparency, a slide, that's all there is. But you didn't, but you didn't have, did you still have the negative though? Or no, there is no negative. Because the transparency you, you is the film. You turned the negative into, into the, into the, there is no negative. So basically you have, you used to have two oh, kinds of film. Shoot, you that, had negative film and, slide film and you had slide yes, film, okay. which is positive no. film. Yeah, I was a little bit confused. I was a little bit confused. Right? Yeah. So, um, the film, the slide, the transparency, that's all there is of yeah, that when image. When you shoot that way, that's all you have. You have the slide. Just like all you have is the, yeah, negative. Is the negative. If you lose yeah. the negative, yeah. you can't print from no negative. Exactly. Right? So there's a big responsibility on the part of a magazine editor who takes a bunch of slides from a photographer yeah. because if he loses them, well, that's that's gone. Yeah, in, mo can't in, in modern terms, it's like giving it's like giving someone the only hard drive you have right. of all your pictures. That's right. what it would be in modern terms. Right. And if he loses that hard drive, you lose all your pictures right. because you don't have a backup. Well, of course, if you're smart, you yeah. back it up somewhere Obviously, else. But, right? but, but if, in, an, in an extreme situation, if you right. give someone the single hard drive you have, that's what that's what it would have been like. Right. You're giving him all you have, like right. all your data. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was what he related. Yes. And, uh, you know, back in the day when, when you contributed slides to a magazine, um, it wasn't unusual that they might lose something or, or in the process of it being put in the magazine, it might get damaged. Yeah. Uh, and when you, when you contributed slides, you would put in your package of slides, what we called a, a delivery memo. Okay. Okay. And a delivery memo was essentially an accounting of the value of what you were sending them. And for, for accounting purposes, Every slide was valued at fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, that was just kind of the ballpark price that was put on a transparency. And the slide in is, terms is, the slide of is a strip of, of no, how many it's pictures? a single image. Oh, a single image was right. fifteen hundred. Well, in terms of the earning potential that that image yeah. may have inside had. a magazine or something, like right? That. Because yeah. if you're sending it to a magazine, it's not a dud. No, it's a keeper. It's a, yeah, it's a good right? picture. Yeah, right. So if you sent them twenty slides. You would value each at fifteen hundred dollars for a total of thirty thousand dollars. Okay. Right. So, despite the fact that that uh, delivery memos were the norm in editorial photography back then, they were not always well received by surf magazines, right? Because surf magazines are kind of loose, and it's all about yeah, bro. And all that. Yeah, it was it was kind of that. a liability for them because if they did well, lose yeah, one, they lost a yeah. lot of money. Yeah. But it's I was not I was not someone who was not going to deliver my stuff with delivery memos. Yes. And, um, you know, on one or two occasions, people lost my stuff and I just had to say, well, you had the delivery memo, right? You, you got yeah. the delivery memo. So cut me a check. I'll be waiting for it. And, uh, wow. you know, there was there was one time when when the magazine kind of um, balked about it and. You know, the editor was like, oh, but come on, man. I was like, no. <laughs> and he kept up with it. And uh, at the time, I had become uh, friendly with Art Brewer. I don't know if you know who Art no, Brewer was. He, he died a couple years ago. I'm not, Art, I'm not, I'm Art not really Brewer, familiar with Art Brewer was the Ansel Adams of surf photographers. 
Okay. Okay. You know who Ansel Adams is. I don't know who Ansel Adams is. You know Um, know who he is, right? Chris knows who he is. Art Art, Art Art Brewer. Art Art Brewer. Best black and white photographer? Okay. Let, let's just say this. Art, later, Art Brewer <laughs> was the Kelly Slater of surf photographers. Okay, okay. okay? Yes, yes. So <laughs> I called up Art and I was like, listen, Art, you know, Fulano lost my slide and he's kind of, you know, he's kind of giving me the runaround. And, you know, what do I do? He said, listen, you tell that guy that he owes you 1500 bucks. So I said, I will absolutely do that, Art. Thank you. Hung up the phone, picked it up called that guy and I said, listen, pal, Art said, that's all he needed to hear. He heard Art said, and he's, <laughs> he changed his tune completely, right? Um, but that's basically the responsibility that they were assuming when they would take your slides off. You, yeah. Right. Uh, and that's a pretty serious responsibility, especially for someone like Alex, who was just starting a magazine, right? He really didn't have any content at that point. He just had an idea. And he had some advertisers probably that agreed to get behind the idea. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you know, he, he was a great person to collaborate with. Um, we collaborated for almost the entirety of the magazine. And then, of course, as the as the landscape changed in editorial and Internet came in and, you know, uh, magazines started to drop like flies. Well, he was one of the magazines that. That dropped and you know he was only in in england for like two maybe three years and then he came back to tortola and did the magazine from tortola which but of course is where he wanted to be did the magazine get 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 ships uh anywhere else or was it a a, Euro, a europe magazine of, of surfing no it was, it was a worldwide thing. worldwide thing yeah, yeah. okay yeah. yeah okay um what was the name again sorry of the magazine the surfer's path the surfer's path okay yeah. and a lot of your viewers that are surfers will remember yeah yeah um but unfortunately, like most magazines, it, you know, it, it uh, got eliminated because of digital technology and, and Internet technology and, you know, social media and everything else that has that has uh, made print so rare. Yeah. And right? what, what would you what would you get paid back in the day for for submitting pictures to, to magazines? Uh, it all depended on how big the picture was published. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, a uh, double page spread was 250. Uh, a, a full page was a buck twenty five and then half pages and smaller, you know, went down from there. A half page was probably like sixty five or seventy five bucks. Um, a cover was between five and six hundred, depending on the magazine. Um, so it wasn't a ton of money. The money was in the advertising. OK. Right. So that if you if if you scored a photo of some sponsored surfer, and their sponsor was going to put a double page ad in Surfer or Surfing Magazine, then you could make about between a thousand and fifteen hundred and for that. And usage. you would have to negotiate that with the sponsor. I'm guessing you would. Like I mean, there like were there were there were some established rates, but of course, you know the uh, the surf industry was always the kind that. Um, it didn't treat people equally. Okay. In other words, you know, the guys like Art Brewer and people in his in his sphere Cir- at his circle, level, yeah. they got paid the top going rate. Okay. Someone like me, they would try to shortchange. Okay, yeah. Right? Um, and uh, I had a couple of, you know, bad experiences with with some East Coast companies that, you know, tried to short me. And um, I basically said, no, you can't do that. Um, They still shorted me. But, you know, one of the things that that didn't necessarily work in my favor as a surf photographer, besides being an East Coast guy, besides being in Puerto Rico, which back then nobody really cared too much about Puerto Rico. They liked the fact that I was here because they could. They could cover it more easily. People didn't really care exp- about the surfing here back then. No, it wasn't. It much? wasn't what it is now. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that that didn't help me beyond those those factors was that I always had a backbone, and I didn't let people, particularly industry people, have their way with me, and that, you know, sort of 
put me in a bad light with some people. Yeah, you weren't like like they say. I, I don't know if you if you know this expression, but you weren't no not not a lambón. No, right? no, I wasn't. I wasn't the the dutiful soldier that was just gonna fall in line and say okay. Yeah, yeah. When they tried to short me, I was like, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. And you, you this is the rate. If you don't want to pay it, don't use the photo. And you didn't live from surf photography, so it was like... Well, a, I did, but I was also doing other yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. Right? It wasn't your main thing, so... I so mean, it didn't really probably hurt that much, half or? and half. Maybe, okay. maybe surf photography was a little more than half. Yeah. I mean, it was a very hand-to-mouth existence, right? The money came in and the money went out. Yeah. It wasn't really like I was saving anything. I wasn't uh, driving a fancy car, you know? I mean, every month was was check to check and tell, tell right? me tell me a little, a little bit about that living in puerto rico i saw i saw in the book you, you had a you mentioned the van that you imported from uh-huh. from the states uh-huh that was the first vehicle i had here what van was um, it um it was uh it was a 1974 chevy vandura um a friend of mine who's a real gearhead and who is a surf buddy of mine from new jersey he now lives in hawaii he's been on oahu for like i don't know 15 20 years Um, it was a vehicle that he had that he wasn't using. So it was a 74 Chevy Vandora. Um, it had, uh, a 69 Camaro engine in it that he had put in it. It was swapped. Well, yeah, because he was a gearhead. Okay. He basically got the thing for nothing. <laughs> and, That's you cool. know, it may not have even had an engine when he bought it. Yeah. yeah. So he got the 69 block from That's a cool. junkyard. He put it in there. I think it was on like its third or fourth uh, cylinder head. Um, we affectionately called it the blue flame because the exhaust manifold was not real solid <laughs> and it had a bunch of holes in it. So it, at night, <laughs> you could see the it had a, it had a, a, th a three speed Hearst shifter on the floor. So at night, when you shifted that thing, <laughs> you'd see the flames come out the exhaust manifold, you know? And I remember once the exhaust manifold just like really got in a bad way. And man, it was like a jet engine. I, I had to drive it from, I think, from Aguadilla your all feet. the way back to San Juan. And the exhaust, the exhaust manifold had like it busted a huge hole in it or it fallen out or something. And it literally sounded like a jet engine. And wow. I'm driving it down <laughs> el, el numero dos y en el espresso. And, you know, the flames coming out the back. It was... It was it was pretty crazy. And, you know, it had a, it had a sliding door on the side, but the slider had a had a tendency to fall off the rail. Oh, wow. and the back doors didn't really latch. So we had like this crisscross of bungee cords <laughs> holding holding the back doors closed. Um, so, yeah, it was a real beater, but it got me from point A to point B. Um, I generally always had a dog. Yeah. When I was in Puerto Rico. What kind of dog? Un sato, un sato. Yeah, yeah. I, I, cool. I rescued. That's cool. Look, by the time I left Puerto Rico, I lost count of the number of dogs and cats that I had rescued. Because, and just since I've been back, which has been a week now, you know, I'm driving around and already like five or six times, you know, I'm driving down the road and you see that pack of, of satos yeah. coming out of the weeds of some lot. Mm-hmm. And then four or five times I've seen the fresh roadkill, you know, whether it's a cat or a dog and, you know, it's just a problem here. And I did what I could, but I always had una sata conmigo y en esa época tenía una, una satita que se llamaba Sandy. There's a picture of her in the back of the book of all the dogs. That I yeah, had. I saw, I saw uh, that part. Yeah. Y Sandy, Sandy defendía todo lo mío hasta la muerte. So I could leave my stuff in the van, right? And jump in the water with my camera or with my surfboard and go surfing. And I knew Sandy was going to be in the van and no one was going to mess with my stuff because Sandy would, she'd, she'd bite them, you know? She wasn't a bad natured dog and she was, you know, like a collie mix, maybe 40 pound dog. She wasn't, it's not like she was a big pit bull, gnarly pit bull. But if you mess with my stuff, she, she'd get on you, you know? So, yeah, that was the first vehicle I had. Um, I ended up I ended up giving that to uh, my girlfriend at the time's dad, who was a heavy, heavy uh, machinery mechanic. And I bought and a she was Puerto Rican. Yeah. Okay. I bought a vehicle from um, from Pablo Diaz. Pache. I don't, I don't, okay. I don't know he, a lot yeah, about the, all the surf, surf, all the, all the surf community knows Pache. Pache is one of the, 
the Quicksilver reps here. Okay. And he was one of the young kids that I worked most closely with early on. And he sold me a uh, Astrovan, which is a Chevy. Yeah. Um, sort of like a mini, uh, uh, a small a van. van, not a minivan. Yeah. But like a small cargo van. Yeah, shorter than those those old Dodge vans or Chevy vans. And right. Yeah. And I had that for probably eight years, maybe. And that van was very good to me. Of course, it was a little more secure. You could lock the doors. Yeah. You know? It was like <laughs> it was like not such a beater vehicle. And then after that, I ended up getting a um, uh, a Ford E250. Uh, and I had a big uh, lockbox built in it. Uh, you know what diamond plate is? So I had a huge, like a, a queen size mattress lockbox built in that thing so that not only could I lock my stuff in it, but I had a mattress on top of it. And, you know, I would just wander the island and I could always crash in my van if I needed to, you know, um, you were doing, that wasn't you, necessarily. You, you were doing van life before it was cool. I was doing yeah. van life. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, I didn't necessarily want to sleep in the van, but if I had to, I could. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, the challenge became finding a place that was relatively safe. And like one of the places out aquí en la isla where... I, I slept a lot in the van was um, just off the golf course in Ramey uh -huh. where the planes come in. Yeah. And like a lot of people park there waiting for the plane that their friends are in or their family is in to come in. Now, of course, I always knew that was safe, although I did get knocked on the window by a cop a couple times. Um, so I, it was relatively safe. But then, of course, you know, every every hour or so there's a plane coming in. Yeah. And it's only a few feet, over, a few hundred <laughs> feet over the van, you know, so it wasn't ideal. But, you know, um, if if that was the only option, you know, uh, it was better than paying for a hotel room. Yeah, for sure. Know? For sure. So and we, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the some of the pictures I saw inside the book, obviously, starting with the with the cover. Uh -huh. It's it's Carlos Cabrera, right? Mm -hmm. And the and the the biggest wave that's well was ever surfed in Puerto Rico, right? Is well, that right? Or, uh, yeah, it's or is the biggest it's the biggest wave that has ever been photographed, photographed, being ridden, surfed, yeah. being ridden, being ridden, yeah. Um, as far as I know, uh, that was uh, March twentieth of two thousand eight. Um, it was what became known as the swell of the century. Okay. Um, it was a two day swell, uh, which is kind of rare. For for a two-day swell to be that big. Um, the second day was a little bigger than the first day, but the first day was not small by any means. Um, so yeah, that that is an image that uh, has been published pretty widely and was certainly worthy of the cover. Yeah, I've, I've, and, I've seen it before I saw it in, in your book. I've, yeah, I've and around, I yeah. just knew that the cover had to be something kind of heart-stopping. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, a lot of people... It, that the cover throws a lot of people off because they don't understand that the waves can get that big here. Right. Uh, and despite the fact that it says right on the cover, Puerto Rico surfing culture, you know, um, in fact, not long ago, I posted it on my, my Facebook business page. Uh, and you know, the, the comments started coming in and a photographer colleague of mine from Northern California, said uh made a comment something like uh it's doing a good imitation of jaws and then some other california guy underneath him responding to his comment understood that this friend of mine this colleague of mine was was saying that it was jaws and so he said something like yeah i've been trying to tell you know everyone here that it's jaws and so i responded to this guy and i said uh no it's not jaws do you really think that I don't know where my own photos were taken? It's Tres Palmas, Puerto Rico on a historic swell. Look it up. You know, it, it's it's there. And this guy went on a rant telling me that I was a fake, that I was a liar, that that's Jaws, that he knows it's Jaws because of the ripples on the face. He just tried to act like a know-it-all. And the guy just ended up proving what a kook he was. And so it went back and forth for a couple hours. And finally, I just started making comments in Spanish, you know, <laughs> and just putting him in his place in Spanish. And, and and the guy just wouldn't 
shut up. He just kept on making dumb comments. And then, you know, finally I said, look, man, I mean, it's on the cover of my book. You can find it on Amazon. You go ahead, look it up. And then finally, I guess he did an Amazon search or a Google search or something. And he realized that he had made a fool of himself. So he started deleting all his comments and then blocking me. You know, any way you can block someone on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, that that image has kind of thrown some people off. But, you know, it's Puerto Rico and and it's it's got the shock value. Yeah. And it's an image that people have grown to have a lot of um, pride in and with good reason. Because, you know, I've always said that Puerto Rico doesn't have anything to envy of any other place in the world in terms of surf. You know, it's as good as anywhere. And the reason that this contest is here right now is because slowly but surely the surfing world began to realize that Puerto Rico's for real, you know? And when, when surfers like Brian and Dylan and Carlos and, you know, a lot of other guys who have been on the international stage come from Puerto Rico and they go to all these far-flung places, you know, they, they, they've been to Hawaii every year, they go to Tahiti, they go to um, Indonesia, you know, they go to the heavy spots in Europe. I mean, look at Dwight, uh -huh. you know, one of, one of the, the more recent places to get a lot of clout as a big wave uh, destination is Ireland. Okay. Okay. And, you know, Dwight is a warm water guy. And, you know, I started seeing photos of him in places that I knew were Ireland because I've been to Ireland and I shot a lot of photos there. And, you know, I mean, when a guy like Dwight shows up at a heavy, heavy slab in Ireland and he's a warm water guy and he puts the wetsuit on and he turns heads. That brings attention to yeah, Puerto Rico. That's a challenge for, for someone like yeah. that. Because and you, and people another... begin to realize that Puerto Rico is no joke. Yeah. You know, and that's the reason that this contest is happening here, that the wider international surf community uh, began to realize over the years that that Puerto Rico is for real and that they could have a contest like they're having here right now. You and know, let's talk. Let's talk about a little bit uh, uh, about that. Uh, you're you're here right now. Because uh, you're you're a vendor inside the, the right, contest, right? Right. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much retired in terms of shooting surf. Yeah. Um, I live in Florida now. There's not a whole lot of surf. Um, you know, I have a family, and my life kind of revolves around other things. But when I learned that this event was going to be here, I I just felt like because the entire surfing world was going to be here, that I needed to have a presence. Yes. And that if I didn't have a presence, I was missing a big opportunity to give people a better sense of, you know, how good the surf can be here and not just here, but down there, over there, yeah. back in San Juan, you know, all around the island. Bunch of spots. Yeah. Right. It's not just it's not just here. And of I course, people know, know they, that. I didn't even know they, they really surfed here. Yeah. Like I've passed here a couple of times. I, 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 I had never... Cause I'm, I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm interviewing you because I was interested in the photography aspect of it. I like surfing, but mm -hmm. I don't have experience photographing surf. Right. Uh, I, I just, I came to this contest and like I, like I told you in your tent the other day, I just got a long lens like barely a year ago. That's the first mm -hmm. long lens I've had my whole life. I've been shooting cars my whole life. Right. I've been shooting. Uh, I've been shooting since I was like 15 years old. I'm 27 now. Uh, and I've and I've seen surfing and I've gone to a couple of Corona surf right. events and all that. Yeah. And uh, but I, I, I obviously, like you said, it's great that you came because I met you mm -hmm. and uh, and the, such rich history in Puerto Rico for surfing, like a bunch of stuff I learned in, inside your book. Like I'm learning so much new stuff since I wasn't inside. Well, you know, my my like, book covers my era from 92 to 2012 to 2012 yeah. so it's already 12 years old and the the beginning stage of my time here is is now 30 years yeah. ago so you know yeah but it, it's, it's easier to to it, I, i like that that era is really cool that you documented it because it's easier now to to notice people like Havana Cabrera or or, or dwight or mm -hmm. or uh, Ted, Ted Tuff, 
mm-hmm. all those, all these people that you because you see them in social media, but right now people like Carlos Cabrero, which is the person who was in that picture we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's still pretty active inside surfing. His daughter's surfing yeah, right now professionally. Sure. sure. And uh, but that's the kind of person that he has a big influence because he ha- he has the store and right. all that. But like all the old surfers, like maybe if you if you mention some names, I'll, I'll kind of notice them. But since I'm not inside the surf scene, I don't really. I well, don't really yeah, know. and and back then, you know, before before the internet and social media, the only way you got recognition was by getting your photo in the magazine. Yes, and that was not an easy task, you know, especially if you come from Puerto Rico and there's not a whole lot of surf photographers, right? So, like I said earlier, that's kind of the void that I tried to fill when I when I came here, mm-hmm. um, and you know what I like to make clear about my my book is that I don't pretend that it's a book about the history of surfing in Puerto Rico. Yeah. You know, it's it's what I saw through my lens. That's the history you captured during the time that I was here between 92 and 2012. Yes. That's all it is. And before me, there is a whole lot of history that happened that I'm still learning about. Right. And there's people who were part of that that era before me, which, you know, started in the early 60s and and Monty, ran right up to when I showed up. Monty Smith and all that. that right. Crew. There is a lot of people who did a lot of stuff to make what I did possible. Yeah. Right. Um, there, there's a guy who died just last week, uh, Benjamin Jorge okay. and his son Gamalier who lives out in Isabella now, they're originally from Catano, was a good, is a good friend of mine and was one of the guys that I worked a lot with in the early days because he lived in Catano and he knew some waves in his neighborhood that back then were very not frequented. So we could go to those places on the days when, you know, Aviones was good, but who wanted to be in Aviones with a hundred other people? Uh, so I'd hook up with Gamma and we'd end up at his local spots in Dorado or or uh, Levitown uh, or um, Cataño or lo que fuera. And we could work in peace. So his dad was basically the Duke Hanamoku of Puerto Rico. OK. And he started surfing in the early 60s and he surfed until he was 80. Wow. And he died the other day, just shy, I believe, of his 84th birthday. Um, and, you know, he's a guy that that is in the book. Um, he's a is guy. Is he the that, guy who had the mechanic? Who He was like a uh, uh, there was there was a guy, a dad and a son who had like like a like a junker. No, that's Pablo. That's, oh, that's another that's guy. Pache. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you'll 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 find Don Benji. Um, you know, Don Benji. Oh, you uh, have a picture of him? I on, have on, a. Uh, there's a portrait of him, en un, a tight, tight portrait of his face. Como un columpio, o frente, frente a, no, no, that's Ricky De Soto, okay. another guy so who's no longer with us. I'll, I'll but you'll find it. I'll find anyway, it, I'll find it. Um, Benji, um, you know, like I say, he was pretty much the Duke Hanamoku of of Puerto Rican surfing. And I learned so much about his era of the history of, of surfing in Puerto Rico that I never would have known were it not for him. And he was the most humble, most kind-hearted, most hardworking guy, uh, you know, raised his family, his three sons, um, by first he worked, uh, he was one of the first lifeguards at the hotels down in San Juan. Okay. Um, he was a, a circus performer. He was a trapeze artist. He was an incredible waterman. Before the term waterman was even coined, he was it. You know, he was a surfer. He was a sailor. He was a fisherman. He was a spear fisherman. I mean, the guy was. Yeah, he did everything well, he in the did ocean. A, he did everything in the ocean. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, unfortunately, we lost him last week. Uh, and it broke my heart. But I feel fortunate to have known him. And to have been able to call my friend you know because he was the real deal and he he you know he and and his entire family just opened their home to me 
you know, his his wife, Gamma's mother, always made sure that, you know, that 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 I had had breakfast when I came to pick him up at 530 in the morning to go surfing. Um, they're just really, really. Gente de, de corazón. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to make clear that I don't pretend that my book is is a history book about surfing in Puerto Rico. It's not. It's just what I saw yeah. during the time I was here, which now, yes, is part of history, but um, isn't the totality of the history. Yeah. And a lot of history has been made since I left, you know. Um, and there's a lot of surfers that are the top dogs now that I never had the chance to work with. Yeah. And there were a lot of guys that were the top dogs before I showed up that I never had a chance to work with. Uh, and I always do my best to um, make that distinction that, you know, look, this is just what I saw during the 20 years I was here. And, um, you know, 20 years is a long time. And if you're in any way relatively good at shooting surf photos over 20 years, you're going to compile a pretty good, you know, collection of keepers. Yeah. And that's essentially what my book is, you know. Um, I think I I edited from like 50,000 images and I got down to about 260 and I had to cut about 80 to get it to a, a, an amount that would fit in the book comfortably. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the book is something I'm really proud of. I'm lucky that I was able to do it just before I left, before life took me away from Puerto Rico. Uh, and I like to think that it's it's one of the best tangible, um, you know, one of the one of the best tangible representations of how good the surf can be here. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to be here is I felt like I wanted to give the people that were coming from all around the world an opportunity to, to bring something home from Puerto Rico that was representative of the quality of the surf here. Yeah. Right. Instead of, uh, you know, a keychain or a, a, a refrigerator magnet or a little Bejigante mask, you know, all of which are really cool. Yeah, yeah. And nice, you know, nice mementos to have from a trip like this to Puerto Rico. I just felt like, you know, if if the, the surfing community, the international surfing community was going to be here, that, you know, I'd have a good chance to sell some books to some people who would appreciate it, you know, more than most. Yes. So I, w I was going to now that you mentioned uh, your, your friend Benja, uh, I was going to ask you because I want to I want to start finishing the, the interview. Uh, what are uh, your your like top five uh, people you, you, you shot in, in inside surfing? Like like they don't have to be the best surfers. Like, I don't know, maybe the, the most influential or the people you you had the best relationship with inside your, your 20 year history in Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. like, those top five people you think about. Uh, well, Benji's certainly one of them. Yeah. Mostly because of his stature and the fact that he paved the way. What was his full name? Benjamin Jorge. Benjamin Jorge. Okay. Uh, he, you know, he, he paved the way for everyone that came behind him, which is pretty much everyone. Um, you know, his son Gamma is an incredible surfer, also a, a, a great waterman. Uh, who who I worked a lot with in the early days uh, and who afforded me, um, you know, sort of like he 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 tuned me into spots that were just outside of San Juan that not many people were keen on. And we were able to work quietly and efficiently on days when, um, you know, there were a lot of other spots working. Yeah. Uh, and I could have stayed in San Juan. But if I just drove out to Levittown, then suddenly it was like a different world mm -hmm. and and uh, easier to work and less crowd and, you know, and um, just more more fun because, you know, it's less crowded. It's just us kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, Carlos, obviously, is somebody I worked with extensively. Carlos Cabrero? Yeah. Okay. And and who, you know, being one of the top surfers on the island, um, you know, the guy just charges. And when you're swimming around with a camera in the water, um, especially, 
you know, uh, not that if you're shooting from the beach, you don't need this, but when you're swimming around in the, in, in the water with a camera, you need to be working with the best guys. If you're yeah. going to get the best pictures, you need to be working with the best guys because it's kind of like a dance, you know, it's a choreography between you and the surfer, you know, you have to know where to be and the surfer has to see where you are before he takes off on that wave. So he decides, well, what can I do here? Right. It's, it's really quite intricate and yeah. people don't, people who, who don't surf or, or haven't worked with a, a water photographer, um, can't really understand the level of, of coordination and choreography that goes into like scoring good water shots. Um, and remember back in the day when we had, you know, 36 shots on a roll, you had to be selective. You couldn't just run the motor drive and you weren't getting 20 frames a second. Yeah. You know, so it was a, it was a, a you know, a, a different, the, the learning curve used to be like this, you know, digital slowly, but surely flattened the learning curve. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, now that, now that you mentioned the, the, the role, right. How was it when you were in the, in the enclosure? Like, did you, did you program yourself like, oh, I'm going to be in the water maybe, I don't know, like like an hour, hour and a half, and I'm going to well, do this whole roll, or I'm going to do a roll, then I'm going to get out and put another roll on? Like, how did you coordinate yourself? Both ways. I mean, obviously, you needed to be selective about what you shot. Yeah. Which sometimes, you know, would make certain people not happy. Because if some guy who is just you know, a recreational surfer yeah, you don't happens shoot to be out way, there yeah. and he gets the wave of his life and he's right in front of you and you don't shoot it because you're working with Carlos and, you know, and, and whoever else. Yeah, you can't waste the, the film um, right. somewhere else. You know, and, and look, when the magazine, when you're working closely with the magazine, they're basically giving you the film and they're paying for the processing. Okay. So they don't want to see pictures of Fulano and Mangano. They want to see the people they, they want to see. see. Right, yeah. right. And when people ask did you get that wave and you say sorry man no then that could bring some heat down on you yeah. you know nowadays with digital you can just shoot everyone yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter yeah right yeah. because you've got three thousand photos you can pretty much on your infinite, card. infinite right infinite. <laughs> right um so you know carlos was certainly one of those people um you know uh i mean the list is long man The list is long. Try, try to try to give me three more, three more. <laughs> um, maybe I don't know a, a picture you really like of someone, or maybe. Well, I'm just trying to think of uh, like you know the the people who have the highest volume of of photos in the book. Okay. Um, you know, Carlos is one of them. Gamma has quite a few photos. Benji, just because Benji was Benji. Yeah, Benji yeah. was the Duke, you yeah. know. Um, you know, I have an incredible photo of Aaron Geiger at Gas Chambers. Um, Gas Chambers was always a, a wave that kind of eluded me until I scored this photo of, of Aaron that one day. Um, Dylan Graves, obviously, I worked with a lot because uh, he was the young, hot, you know, surfer when he was... You know, by the time he was like 13 or 14, he had been sponsored for a bunch of years and he was, you know, just blowing up everywhere. Brian Toth, you know, was a guy I worked with. I mean, it, it, look in the book. I mean, I have pictures of those kids yeah, when, yeah. They were, when they were 10, 11, 12 years old and now they're in their 30s. You yeah, know? right. Right before we started the, the interview, like five minutes before you walked by uh chris was shooting the surfers because mm -hmm. i told him go go shoot like we're here let's go shoot the right. locals before steve comes and then uh we were setting up and uh carlos and Havana go up the stairs uh -huh. right before we started the interview and right. and i i remember that i got to the book where where there's the pictures of carlos and Havana holding uh -huh. Havana when she was a, a yeah. just a, she a, was a like, little girl she was like three or four maybe yeah yeah it was 2003 i think Um, so, you know, uh, we could, we could pinpoint her age, but I think she was about three or four, maybe. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, th those are, are the people that, uh, I worked with a lot and, um, you know, our relationship was pretty fruitful for both of us, you know, or for all of us, you know, in conjunto. Um, and I was just very fortunate, you know, I was very fortunate that I came here when I did. I was very fortunate that, you know, the people here, 
you know, uh, allowed me to do what I did with my camera. How, how um, was how was it you you as as like yeah quote unquote a gringo you know coming from the states and taking pictures like how did the locals react did they did they like that you were doing it in, in well, the first yeah, place? Well, yeah, look, because you, um, you said the locals weren't doing it, so right the the, the the way things go in surf destinations is that at first there's a place that has really good surf. And isn't getting any recognition, isn't getting any attention because no one is shooting photos. Right. And that's kind of where Puerto Rico was when I got here. And of course, when you show up to a place like that, um, everyone is happy to see you. Right. And then as the as as your work gets published and as the the notoriety and the reputation of that destination as a place with good waves rises what happens people from elsewhere start showing up right and then the locals begin to think hmm maybe having this guy with a camera here isn't the best thing right the people start noticing their beaches and all that well because the 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 traveling surfers start yeah. showing up in droves because they've seen the pictures of chatarra Yeah. They've seen the pictures of Middles. They've seen the pictures of Trace Palmas. They've seen the pictures of Gas Chambers. And they want a piece of the action, right? So the dynamic tends to change as the publicity and the notoriety of that destination rises. And, you know, I, I saw the same thing happen in the Canaries. When I was first there in 87, there was no one with a camera around. I, I went back and lived there in 90, 90 and 91, and I was still, you know, the only guy swimming around with a camera most of the time. I went back to do a, a, an article for Surfer Magazine in, in 2000 or 2001, and by then the cat was out of the bag. You know, magazine crews were coming to the island all the time, and I went to a couple places on outer islands where the locals were like, uh-uh. Pack that camera up, get out of here, you know? Yeah, and I would begin to say, but wait, yo soy bien amigo de fulano. No. <laughs> no me importa, pep. Sorry, me importa un pepino, papo. You know? Beat it. And this was this was film days, right? Magazine days where uh, it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't like yeah. social media where it's like instant, right. you know? Right. Now right. it's now and, it's crazy. And now everyone knows all the beaches. Right. And, and now like, stuff. you know, the guys who show up at the beach and they shoot some photos and immediately put them on social media and identify the spot and yeah. all that, they're not really doing themselves any favors. Yeah. You know? Like you'll notice in the book, you know, the places that are already well identified are identified. But there's a bunch of places that I just call the lost coast. Okay. La Costa Perdida. Yeah. Because they're not really on the radar as much as all the well-known spots. And I don't want to put them on the radar. I don't want to be the guy yeah. that puts them on the radar. If you can figure out where it is, well, then that's part of what surfing is all about. You know? Yeah, finding the spots. Right. It's your, it's your adventure, right? It, it, you know, there was, a, there was an ad campaign uh, that Rip Curl did back in the day. And the tagline was... Um, Fortune favors the brave, right? Which means go out and find it. You know, we're not telling you where it is. We found it. It's up to you to go and find it, you yeah. know? So I didn't want to be that guy that, that blew these places out of the water, that brought attention to these places that wasn't warranted or wasn't welcome, right? Because the chatarras, the, you know, the, the, the middles, the gas chambers, the Trace Palmas, the, the Marias, all those places, they've been on the map for a long time, right? Everyone knows where they are. Uh, when, when I get to places that are on the lowdown, you know, first and foremost, I want to make sure the locals are okay with me being there with my camera. And usually I go surfing first. You know, and I'm talking about over the course of weeks or months. Yeah. And it's only after I get to know the, the, the locals that 
I might pull out my camera. And as long as they're okay with it, then I feel like, okay, I've done my job. Now, the next step then beyond that is, okay, I document the, the, the people that I bring there, provided the locals are all okay with it, but I'm also going to document the locals. And when I get good pictures of the local guys, I'm going to make sure that I get them to them. Yeah. You know, like, hey, that wave, that nice wave you got, I got it. Give me your email address, you know, because we're talking in, you know, the, the more recent times. Yeah, yeah. Give me your email address and I'll send it to you. Um, you know, uh, Chessy Montalvo, who's an Arecibo guy, who's one of the coaches of the team. Um, he's someone who who tuned me into some of these places that were not so much on the map. And, you know, he's a great surfer. He's a great guy. He, you know, he, he's respected by all the locals pretty much everywhere. Um, he, he gets it. You know, he's been around the world. He knows how to carry himself in the water. Um, and and when he started tuning me to some of the spots that I hadn't been to before, I just knew that that came with a lot of responsibility. You know, if I'm just going to go surfing, you know, that's one thing. Like, if you're just going surfing, then, okay, you can surf it, but, you know, don't bring a carload of people. Yeah. Right? Once you pull out a camera, it's another level of responsibility. Yeah. Right? And I always took that responsibility responsibility pretty seriously because I wanted to keep the door open, you know? And, you know, like, back in the day when, when a lot of photographers were coming on magazine trips from Florida, from California, from the Northeast or whatever they didn't necessarily feel that responsibility because they were going to be here for two weeks or three weeks and they could go wherever they want, do whatever they wanted. And then they were gone. Yeah. Right. I didn't really have that luxury. If you want to call it that I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a luxury, but you know, I was here, I was becoming part of the fabric and I had a big responsibility on both sides of the lens sort of, and on both sides, you know, both edges of the knife, I needed to try to promote it as much as I could and promote the local surfers as much as I could, while at the same time trying to keep the secrets, right? Because we don't wanna we don't wanna draw a roadmap to to some of the hidden gems that exist on this place because those should be reserved for the local people, right? And there's a whole dynamic of etiquette and and you know hierarchy that is kind of being lost now because of social media, yeah. because of the way things get broadcast yeah, in the quick. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really important to surf culture in general and, and, and keeping people honest, right. In terms of, you know, look, if you're not from here, you got to carry yourself a certain way, you know, like Margara is a place that, you know, I never really spent much time at until like two thirds of the way through my time here because it had a reputation of having gnarly locals, you know, and locals that didn't put up with a whole lot of BS. And you can't just show up at my God, paddle out and expect to catch any way you want. It doesn't work like that because there are people who grew up right here and who have been surfing that place for decades and generations who you have to give the right of way. You have to give them the respect that they deserve. And that's something that is kind of being lost, you know, and it's 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 an incredibly good thing that this event is happening here because it's letting people know how good the surf can be yeah. in a place in Puerto Rico that they generally didn't know about because they know about Isabela and Aguadilla and Rincón. Uh -huh. Ahí es que está la fama. Here is still kind of, in the international sense, under the radar. And look, the surf right, you know, from, from El Puente hasta El Barrio is on a whole nother level from pretty much anything that Rincón 
has. And Rincon has all the fame from the 68 World Championships and all that, but that was a different era. Surfboards weighed 40 pounds back then. It has the prevailing wind offshore, right? The northeast wind hits it straight offshore. The waves are a little bit more acostadas. So um, it's it's an incredibly good thing that the, that the contest is happening because it's opening a lot of eyes. At the same time, there's a lot of responsibility that is being assumed by El Municipio de, de Arecibo, not only to protect these resources, because that's what they are. They are resources. These waves will bring droves of people. And Arecibo has to be ready for that. And, you know, you can see, especially along here, that it's, 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 it's being developed. It's being improved. You know, the Airbnbs that are along here, they're going to have surfers in them every winter. You know, the people are going to come. And not all of those people are going to understand, like the pro surfers who are coming for this event, that they can't just paddle out at Margara or aquí en el pico or rastreal and just go right out to the peak and spin on the first wave that comes and go. You know, it doesn't work like that. And people who have traveled a lot to surf understand that. They understand that, you know, they're, that, that you have to have a lot of respect for the local people. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it never hurts to speak the language. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a huge sign of respect when you, can, exactly. you can speak the local and, language. And when I came to Puerto Rico, I yeah. was already speaking fluent Spanish. Yeah. You know? I mean, I had a, a you know, a... a, a, a peninsular or a canary accent and my friends here kind of me, me burlaron del acento que tenía. <laughs> Al igual que cuando estaba allí, yo tenía el acento de aquí, o el, el acento bien caribeño y allí me, me burlaban de la manera que hablaba, ¿no? Yeah. So it kind of, it went both ways, but um, look, man, like I told you, Spanish got me my first job and my first real job in, in photography as an, you know, a staff assistant. Um, Spanish has opened so many doors for me. Uh, and it's another thing that I feel really fortunate that I have in my in my toolbox, yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly good that this event has happened, but it brings with it a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the hope is that the, the municipio is going to seize that responsibility. They're going to protect the resources. They're going to um, make sure that they do everything in their power to keep the the visiting surfers um, from from, you know, pisando al mojón, you know, like, I mean, a friend of mine from Jamaica who's on the team who I've seen a few times since I've been here told me that one of his teammates came in somewhere in the wrong spot here. And he got his hands and feet just full of erizos, Ooh. you know, and he spent like an hour or two in that in the the medical um, trailer. Wow. Getting them taken out, you know, um, it's it's that kind of thing that the municipio has to step up and make sure that people understand, you know, having lifeguards would be really, really important. And what does that do? It employs local people. Yes. You know. There's, I'm sure there's droves of local surfers that would love nothing more than to be a lifeguard on these beaches. And, and how, how would you how how would you like like just to talk a little bit about that? How how would you deal with those with those kinds of problems like the Ariso thing? Like like would you would you do like I don't know like local local guides to to surfing out of sea or something like that? Like like well, how would how would you how would you do that? The first way you do that is by documenting well the ins and outs and the, the, the oceanographic dynamics of these surf spots. Okay. Right. You want to have signs that say, listen, this is a, this, like this is a, you know, uh, uh, an advanced intermediate surf spot. Okay. Right. Yeah. Treat it like a like Margata, double black diamond. That's no joke over there, especially when it's big, you know, um, you need to point out where are the spots to get out, to go into the water. Where are the spots to get out of the water? Where are the spots that you don't want to try to get in and out of the water, right? Having lifeguards would be such a huge plus because not only are you employing local people who 
who have spent their lifetime surfing these waters, right? Um, but you're, you're giving the visiting surfer the resource, the guy who's going to be up here and see the guy who's just showed up and is at this Airbnb and, you know, just walked across the street for a surf for surf and is going out in the wrong spot. He's going to blow his whistle. He's going to say, no, 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 no. Come up here. I'll tune you. Yeah, that's going to be your, your surf guide. That's going to be. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. And and. You know, that's just a lifeguard context. Yeah, yeah. A surf guide context takes it a step further, right? Uh, and and that's a, an important function to to offer, right? Because it's not always going to be perfect here, right? Sometimes you're going to need to get in a car and go somewhere else. Yeah. And you don't want to you don't want to send those people to Hollows, right? <laughs> you want to send them to Cuevelindio. You know, you want to you want to send them to, um, you know, some other spot along here that's not so heavy. You know, you don't want to send them to Peñon de Mera, right, where the waves are big and powerful and the locals are, you know, protective of that. Um, so there's there's lots of things they can do to help facilitate Arecibo becoming the surf destination that it's almost certain to become in in the wake of this event um but they have to take it seriously you know it can't be like a one and done kind of yeah. thing you know once all this infrastructure and all these people leave mm -hmm. they can't just ignore it you know it's it's a big responsibility and um and it, it just it should be taken seriously because the 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 livelihood of surfing in puerto rico is going to depend to a certain degree yeah. on on how the aftermath of this contest is managed. No, and this this right? contest is, isn't isn't just going to be like a surf destination for tourists. Like, look at all these kids that are probably going to get into surfing because they came to this contest. Well, like, yeah, there's a lot, a bunch of locals that are going to become surfers because of the that's contest right. too. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's so it's so influential. It's, and it's, it's gonna huge. it's gonna bring commerce. Mm -hmm. You know, Airbnb, restaurant, surf shops. You know, I mean, there's no reason why there couldn't be a surf shop right along yeah. here somewhere. Yep. And it would do incredibly well, probably, mm -hmm. especially if the infrastructure for the visiting surfer is strong and and is well managed. And that would know? be that would be your your like your local surf guide, because because I, I did some skateboarding when I was younger. And obviously the, the local Pueblo shop was the person you asked, like, oh, where, where do I where do I go right. skate? Right. Like, and that's the same thing. Where do yeah. I go surf? Should yeah. I go here? Should I go over there? Like, yeah, it, it also makes like a community. Sure. Yeah, sure. And you're going to have a variety of 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 abilities of surfer that show up. You know, you're going to have the guy who who is just learning to surf and the guy who's been everywhere. Yeah. Right. So you got to treat those two people differently. And there's exactly. a lot of there's a lot of varieties in between those two extremes. For sure. So, yeah. So uh, so Steve, let's let's uh, let's end it at this note. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Like, well, thank you. You, you, for the you, have, you have so much, so much experience, specifically in, in the in the island. Like, it was so awesome that 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 you were able to document all those pictures and obviously make it in, like you said, make it into something you can you can hold, you can see. Right. And and it's there for generations to come. And uh, and like like I always ask people before I finish my podcast, like something you want to say before before we leave, maybe promote something or, or a message to the people who are well, watching. Well, just, you know, I, I always try to just express my my gratitude for having been able to do what I did here. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate to, like I said before, document the, the era that I did. I was very fortunate to to publish a book. Yeah, the book kind of fell out of the air, you know. Um, it was something I wanted to do, but I didn't really necessarily know how to pull it off. And then some stars aligned or some planets aligned. What, what, it, what year was the book published? 2012. 2012. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so um, it's been, it's, it's already been what? 12 uh, years. 12, 12 years. It'll be 12 years in September, I think, that it, that it was published. 12 years, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to accomplish that. It's something I'm very proud of. It's something that, um, you know, has given me a certain amount of um, credibility and um, legitimacy, sort of. Yeah. Um, 
it it's helped to create something of a of a legacy for me as a photographer yeah i, w- I was standing talking with you the other day and like two people walked by like oh like Steve, he's a legend, you know, like, like, I don't like, like that term, <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I don't, I, I just feel like, you know, I was just another guy with a camera, you know, I happen to be able to manage a camera a little bit better than most, but you, 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 um, you, you made it happen. Like, like other than, other than like, like saying that maybe you managed the camera better than someone else, but you were, you were a better, you documented the stuff better, you know, you, you, you knew how to, how to make people other people see it because maybe maybe i i could i could have documented 20 years of surfing but i i I didn't maybe i didn't make a book or i I didn't show it to other people like yeah i mean you know one thing that that i also feel fortunate and 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 proud of is that you know when i was young and able i went for it yeah you know i went for it hard like when i shipped that beater van here (laughs) And it was blowing flames out the manifold, you know, and I was, you know, the first guy swimming around at Chatarra and, and I just, I'm just the kind of person that when I, when I decide I'm going to do something, I don't do it 50%. I do it 110% plus Yeah. because I want to give my best, you know, I want to find out what I'm capable of. For sure. And you know, that was the way I approached my time here in Puerto Rico and, and, you know, my, my work with the camera. And, um, I feel like I, uh, I, I did okay, you know, so. I think you did pretty awesome. Well, thank yeah. you. So, uh, so tell me, uh, social media, where, where can people find you nowadays? Uh, I'm on Instagram at, uh, Steve Fitz photo, uh, Facebook, uh, Steve Fitzpatrick photography, LLC. Um, I also have a personal Facebook page uh, that, you know, you can find me. You yeah. might not be able to recognize me because I'm right now. My profile picture is me playing hockey. <laughs> I'm a goalie. So okay. um, you might not expect to see that. But that's that's uh, what I look like on Facebook. I also have a storefront website at shop.stevefitzpatrick.com where you can buy a variety of um, prints from paper to uh, aluminum, acrylic, wood canvas and some ancillary products like uh, coffee mugs cell phone cases throw pillows for sofas and uh, tote bags um, of which i have some samples at my booth Um, i'll be here until the end of the event so uh, anyone who's who's keen to have a look at at my book or my other stuff and uh, you know wants to see what that's all about can stop by my tent down there it's right in front of the municipal building and I'm always, you know, interested to meet new people and talk story and, um, you know, help budding photographers out. Yeah. Um, that's something that I really enjoy doing because um, not everybody is into doing that. And there were some key people who did that for me when I was, you know, learning the ropes. And um, I like to do that for others now because why wouldn't I? Awesome. You know? Yeah, so guys, you can find me at uh, on Instagram as uh, Pedro Captures. This is actually the first episode of this new new concept of podcast I'm doing because like I like I told oh, yeah? you, like I told you before, I mostly did uh, automotive content. Right. So this is the first episode I did of this podcast I want to do of of uh, fellow photographers, maybe okay. do some some people who do surf, maybe skateboarding, other right. stuff I like other than cars. Uh-huh. I want to put in in this in this avenue. So you're the you're well, the cool. first person I you interview. Should, you should so, talk to some of the surfers. You yeah, know? yeah. For that, that, that's why that's why I'm doing this. I'm I'm gonna try to post this this week, maybe. Right. And tag a couple of surfers if they're interested and they want to talk to me. Just just are you coming back this this weekend? Yes, I wanna I wanna come. I, I'm, I'll probably come Saturday because I have a, I have a car thing on Sunday. Right. But uh, I'll, I'll definitely come here. Well, definitely, come man. I mean, you know, touch base with the federation. You know, get in with the team. Yeah. Give some business cards out. Let them know, for sure. Let them know what you're up to, and I'm sure they they'd be more than happy to sit down with you like yeah, I awesome. did. And uh, you know, appreciate the opportunity. Hey, thank you, thank you, Steve, for the all time. Right, Guys, My thank pleasure. you for watching, and make sure to follow Steve on all the social medias, and we'll see you in the next one. All right, cool. Ahí está. ¿Cómo tú ves?